click subscribe, click the thumbs up on our messages, click the little bell. Get your friends saved, get your family saved. Let's turn in our Bibles this morning to 1 Kings chapter 3, 1 Kings 3, starting in verse 3. Now Solomon loved the Lord, or Solomon loved Yahweh, walking in the statues of his father David, except he sacrificed and burned incense on the places, in other words, things he wasn't supposed to do. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place, and Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. Now that must have taken quite a bit for the priests to do. A thousand burnt offerings. Probably took all day. In Gibeon, Yahweh appeared to Solomon in a dream at night, and God said, ask what you wish me to give you. I find it fascinating. Ask what you wish me to give you. When we give a sacrificial gift, now there are people in transition here and those uh, many people are in transition right now in their lives. Maybe they lost a loved one, a husband or a wife died. Uh, maybe uh, your children moved out of the home. Maybe you just retired. Maybe you just moved to a new location and you're just trying to set up and you're in a brand new season and you want God to speak to you and tell you the first, second, third things to do in order that you're doing everything right and everything correct. And if you're one of those people, now's the time to make a sacrificial gift to God. Now's the time to turn to God and say, God, I'm, I want to be serious here with you for a little bit. I have not given in a while. I haven't given anything big in a while. And for some, many people watching our broadcast, because we're on so many stations now, some people have never given anything at all to God. And, and some people watching us for more than two decades still haven't given to this ministry. It's time that you gave a sacrificial gift, because look what happens to Solomon, right? In verse 5, in Gibeon, Yahweh appeared to Solomon in a dream at night, and God said, ask what you wish me to give you. And you make a sacrificial gift to God, God stands up and pays attention and says, okay, my child here is wanting to hear from me, and they're sacrificing what they could have instead to have wisdom or knowledge or direction. And that's really important in many people's lives. But you have to make the break with the world in order to hear from heaven. And I encourage you to do that here today. You can go to our website, mountainfaith.org, and you can give on there. And also you can give regularly. And if you'd like to know how to do that, you don't know how to do that, maybe you're, the, you're not sophisticated enough to know how to operate all these things on our website, we'd be happy to give you a phone call back. Just call us anytime on our church phone number, and that again is on our website as well. Let's pray. Dear Father Yahweh Elohim, we invoke your name over every gift and every giver. And Father, all those that have given these last 27 plus years, Father God, I ask that you give them back double their daily bread, that you rebuke the devourer for them and for their sake, and that you pour out such a blessing upon them until it overflows. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen and amen and amen. Ushers? Say, this is my Bible. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do. And I can have what it says I can have. My mind is alert and my spirit is receptive to the living word of God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Before you take your seats, greet a couple people around you and say, hey, you're looking good. You're welcome to take your seats here this morning. And if you're uh, watching uh, live or you're watching us on television here today, I want to just uh, say a couple things before we get too far into this teaching. This is day number five, also week number five of my teaching on the creation account. Now, I've been teaching on creation for probably 30, 35 years, and certainly I've gotten more sophisticated over that period of time. And then back about uh, 12, 14 years ago, I was driving home and on a Wednesday night from our Bible study, and I saw the moon hanging up. It was a, it was a super moon. And uh, God spoke to me in my spirit and told me to proclaim something to it. And I pointed at the moon and I said, I know who made that. Immediately within a couple weeks after that, even though I had already been teaching on creation, God gave me an ordered format to teach on the six days of creation over seven weeks. 
And the reason for seven weeks is we taught on day six for two different Sundays in a row. On day six, we talk on the first part of the day where all the animals are created, and then the second part of the day over man and woman being created. And we'll be starting that uh, again next week. So we're on day five, and I have enjoyed uh, studying for any of the days as much as I enjoyed studying for this for you here today. Here's the issue. I am teaching for about an hour uh, every single time I get up, and if you're watching this on television, you're only seeing about 22 minutes, 28 minutes maximum if we don't have any other commercials in there at all. And if you want to see the rest of these programs, we have them edited in HD format, and high def format, on our YouTube channel and our other channels too. On, on Spotify, you can hear it. On Vimeo, you can watch it. On Roku, you can watch it. So if you have any of those abilities, go to our website and it'll show all the different links you can click on. But in the center of our website, if you go to mountainfaithchurch.org or davidgonzalezministries.org, right in the very center, there's quick links. And it's very obvious, and right at the very top, there's quick links to our creation teaching. Click on that, it'll take you into the section in our YouTube channel immediately, and you can watch these for free. Now, I have copyrighted symbols all over this teaching, and in fact, I'm over 500 slides. I think I'm up to 540 slides for these seven weeks. But even though it's copyrighted, as long as you're not taking that information out and you want to show it to your congregation, you want to show it to your children, you want to show it in your classrooms, please, it's free. Use it for teaching about the kingdom of God and about how God, who was there, and who witnessed everything, tells us what exactly happened in the most simplest of forms. So I invite you to do that. Again, so if you're watching on television, um, and you want to see the rest of this teaching, you only saw a part of it. And our editing department does the best they can, and I think they do a wonderful job of editing this down. But I'm giving a lot of information that you should see this entire hour. So I invite you to go to davidgonzalesministries.org and watch this in its entirety. All right, today, day five, let's lower the lights here a little bit. Day five, we're going to be talking about uh, birds, fish, leviathan, ocean giants of the deep. So again, this is week five. All right, uh, review the pattern for creation study. Uh, this pattern must be the first and last of any creation study. If your study presupposes any other initial concept or subsequent conclusion, then the study is flawed from the outset. Why? Because God was there, you were not there. All right? If you get anything other than six literal days, you destroy what Jesus and Moses believe, right? For in six days, the Lord, or Yahweh, made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. All right, we know why we should teach it, to show the order and pattern of the life of, of men to follow. Why should we be doing all this? Because all chaos and turmoil comes from not knowing the will of God. And every New Testament doctrine is founded on Genesis 1 and 2. The principles of redemption through Jesus is found in Genesis because any misconceptions and error will be repeated and exaggerated if faith in the Genesis story is not kept intact and protected. And we're not doing this because we're mindless drones. We're doing this because we are thinking human beings and thinking human beings simply want the truth. Tell me what happened. That's all we know. God, tell us what happened. And that's what you're going to be seeing here today. The things we're going to look at on day five. Day one, we saw the creation of heaven, uh, earth and the heavens. We destroyed uh, speculations of an old earth. Day two, a creation of earth's atmosphere. By the way, that program was on television today. Water below and water above. Uh, day three, dry land appears and the creation of all plant life. Carbon dating starts right then. There, even though there's plant life on day three, there is no animal life or bacterium on day three. None whatsoever, and there is a scientific reason for that. I believe that God was following. On day four, the creation of the sun, moon, and stars, God's permanent time clock, order out of disorder, and the nature of how we approach the world. God made a giant galactic time clock calendar for us to follow. He put it in the heavens, and you can follow the stars and the galaxies and uh, season in and season out, and you can know where you're at on the planet. You can even sail the fields of the Midwest and with simply a sextant 
you can come uh, and you can come to know right where you're at at any given time anywhere in the world. Day five, that's today. This is a very busy day for God, so we're going to be talking about a lot of things. You're going to be shocked to see how much God got done in one day. We're going to see the creation of birds, fish, flying insects, and oceans and giants, including Le Leviathan. Uh, uh, bird, fish, breathing, uh, jet propulsion systems, uh, ocean versus, uh, versus land comparisons, and the theory of missing links. And we're going to be reminded that the earth is 71% water. So if someone says 70%, they're accurate. Then next week, we're going to see the creation of animals, that animals serve man. And then uh, two weeks from today, we're going to see the rest of day six, the creation of man, Adam and Eve. And we're going to find out why there is an ish and an isha in the Hebrew and why that's so important to our marriages today. Genesis 1 and 2 unlocks the code for daily life of man. Creation teaching starts with God as creator who signs and witnesses the universe or the cosmos birth certificate. God was there. Since he was there and man wasn't there and speculations of man who was not there to come up with anything else than six days of creation is not only speculation, but it's foolish, and as we pointed out in the book of Romans, that anyone who denies that God even exists denies what they're looking at because they already know that God exists in their hearts from looking at nature around us. And we know that there's six days of work resting on the seventh. You know, how many of the Ten Commandments are being broken today? It's not just the Sabbath any longer. Uh, people say, well, I can break, the, I can break the, the one of the Ten Commandments. I can fornicate. I can live with my girlfriend or my boyfriend. I can commit adultery with my neighbor's wife or my neighbor's husband. I can, and, and then it just goes on and on. So eventually, all the commandments are being broken, but the first one to be broken that I've seen on a mass scale is the breaking of the Sabbath rest. Resting one day in seven. We talked about that. I, 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 take, I can take two or three weeks just talking about the importance of a Sabbath rest and why it's so important. Uh, God gives us provision for food and clothing out of this creation account. Uh, he gives us money for exchange, dominion and responsibility. We talked about the gap theory and why that doesn't work, the ruin reconstruction on day one. That you have to go back. If you want to watch all that, you can go back and watch my first week on that. All right, order comes from disorder principle. All right, this does not work, by the way. It's called entropy, right? Does disorder come from order? Never. It never comes from order. Chaos comes on its own, and you must resist it actively. God ordered one wife. This order comes from breaking that rule. Uh, God ordered darkness for sleep. This order comes from breaking that rule. God ordered plants for food. This order comes from breaking that rule. God ordered one day and seven to rest. This order comes from breaking that rule. God ordered Adam in Genesis uh, 2 to tend and cultivate the earth. This order comes from breaking that rule. Conclusion. God's rules bring order, which resist and push back chaos, which in turn destroys turmoil in your life. All right? Entropy does not work. It never works. We talked about this last week. Uh, leave a car, illustration number one, leave a car out in the yard for 50 years. Uh, it never becomes a Porsche. Leave your, your old Volkswagen or Renault, uh, 1956 Renault sedan made in France, Park it out and back, let the grass go up around it and, and the animals graze around it and it will never turn into a Porsche or Ferrari, right? Illustration number two, shipwrecks do not get put back together once they sink. I have another illustration. Imagine, this is kind of gross, but imagine that you go to the store and or you spend all night, you stay up all night collecting crickets and cockroaches and worms. You put them in a blender because there's life, you turn the blender on, you know what that happens then, and then you pour it out into a pan and you leave it out in nature for a day. Does life come out of that? Two days does life come out of it. Leave it out there for a week. Does any life come out of that mixture? There's life in there and there is, you could say there's life in there, eventually there'll be bacteria in there, but you cannot get life out of non-life. You cannot get a higher order out of a lower order. It simply does not work. You can even introduce cell tissue and you still cannot get life out of non-life or out of disorder. It's never been observed. Which one of these six days of creation could we do without or could we put uh, one before another? 
Uh, Genesis, then, is God's blueprint for order in your life, your marriage, your home, your money, and your salvation. All right, so let's look at what's going on here in the day five of creation. Starting in day one, God speaks time, space, and matter into existence. They happen all at the same time. In the blink of an eye, you could say. He makes the envelope called the expanse, or we know as the cosmos, and makes the earth in that expanse covered in water. Day two, God separates the water from above, called the firmament, and the water from below, called the seas. In the space between, he creates air to breathe for all living creatures. On day three, he creates all plant life in the seas and on land. It's the first time any life form appears, but it is only plant life. Bacterium are not living uh, yet on day three. There's a reason, because bacterium are, is controlled by sunlight, right? Bacterium is most often destroyed by sunlight. Uh, day four, now that the planet Earth has been set up for future life, he now builds a timekeeping system in the heavens for man and creation to live by. God speaks the sun, moon, and stars into existence, uh, setting a permanent clock in the heavens. We saw that last week, today, day five. God creates animal life forms for the first time. The lesser, I'm calling it the lesser, and you're going to see why. The lesser, including fish, sea reptiles, birds, and sea creatures of every kind. This turns out to be a very busy day for God. Now, let's get right into it. Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 20 to 23. Then God said, right? I have it in the Hebrew over here. Vayomer bio, bio Elohim, right? Then God said. That's what's happening in the Hebrew. Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures and let the birds fly above the expanse in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind and God saw that it was good or tov. Seven times in the creation account, God says things are good. When God says something is good, it's really good. God blessed them. Right? When you get blessed by God, you really have a blessing. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply. Fruitful means bear fruit, multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. There was evening and there was morning a fifth day. So that completes day five. What we have here in the Hebrew, this is the whole first part of the verse. It says, Vayomer Elohim. And then it says, Yish Ritzu. Yish Ritzu, that word there, that, that, that's a shin, that's a W, or you, it's an S sound, actually. That's a resh, that makes an R sound, and that's a tazadi right there. So yish, ritsu, is meaning swarms. The English says, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, but the Hebrew doesn't say that. The Hebrew says, vayomer Elohim, uh, yish, Ritsu, and then you have to understand Hebrew. These, this white mark here and this white mark here are added on to give understanding to other things going on within the context of the language. Here is the same thing. There's a shin, a resh, and a final tazadi right here. You see how that looks identical? Look at that. Identical, 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 identical. And that's, that's within the sentence. That's what's called a final tazadi right there. What do we find happening? It means then, let the waters teem with swarms of swarms. God said, let the waters swarm with a swarming of living creatures. That's what's actually happening. It's very poetic. You don't have to read Hebrew to see that I've highlighted these things so that you can identify symbols. All you have to identify these as symbols of living creatures and let fowl fly over the earth uh, over across the expanse of the heavens. And look at that. We have swarming of swarms. Now it continues. All right, so now we're going to be looking at the birds. And then he, then he says, and let the birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. So God talking, Vayomer Elohim, right? And we get down to here. And we said, Vaof, ya, ofa. Vaof, so we have a, 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 an an, an an, a vav, and a vav. And two final pays, here's a final pay, here's a pay, and then a final pay. Two of the same letters right next to each other. So actually saying in the Hebrew, let the birds bird, or let the flying fly. Actually, even using the term birds is too specific. 
He's saying, let the flying things fly. Let flying creatures, let me create flying creatures that fly. So we see the poetic, let swarms swarm, let flying fly. And I find it fascinating. So here it is. Then God said, let the waters swarm a swarming of living creatures and let the fowl fly or let the flying fly over the earth. Right? So we have dominion in these particular areas. What swarms on land? Most birds, flying reptiles were swarming in that day. All right? We have a fossil record that shows that reptiles could fly. We know that squirrels can fly or glide. We know that bats can fly. Bats are, you know, depending on where you would put them in the, in the animal chain or in the animal kingdom, bats are flying winged creatures, and we know that reptiles can fly because we have a fossil record that shows us that. Dragonflies, right? They swarm. Bugs swarm. Flies swarm. When did we first see flies swarming in the Bible? It was in, with the ten plagues coming on Egypt, right? Flies, bees grasshoppers, locusts, right, were swarming in the uh, attack on Egypt. Uh, ants, bacteria, swarm. Flamingos, here we go, swarm. I was in Kenya, and I was at a giant game reserve, and I was looking down. We climbed up a giant rock up about 500 feet into the air and looked over the plain in this giant Kenyan uh, reserve, and I looked down on maybe 20, 30,000 flamingos that were in the brine water that was in front of us that was laid out for a couple miles. So flamingos, they, they swarm. Fleas, gnats, moths, butterflies, right? Big swarms of butterflies fly all the way down to South America and all the way back up to North America every year. Bats, cockroaches, insects, frogs, fleas, lizards swarm. Worms swarm, mosquitoes, we know about them. Turkeys, if you, if you have turkeys on your property, you know that turkeys swarm. Sandhill cranes swarm, geese, swans, parrots, penguins. Penguins are in the bird class, right? That's being made then on day five. Swallows, swallow swarm on the, on the drive here this morning. Kathy and I were looking at all the swallows on all the power lines. Not only did they swarm, but when they parked themselves, they spaced themselves pretty evenly on the power lines. What swarms in the sea? Remember the seas make up 71% of what, what covers planet Earth. Fish, swimming reptiles, pleosaurs, sharks, stingrays, bacteria, frogs. What do we see here? This is the Christmas Island, which I believe is part of the Australian area. Christmas Island has a plague of red uh, crabs that, that swarm and actually travel. Here is something from the Bering Sea of crabs traveling in the bottom of the Bering Sea. Uh, bacteria, frogs, turtles, crabs, starfish, reef dwellers, sea cucumbers, tube fish, plankton, krill. Boy, they swarm, right? Lobsters, sea worms, squid, jellyfish, swordfish, crustaceans, microscopic life, algae, penguins. They get to be in both places, in my opinion. Sardines, marlin, tuna, salmon. So we see some sardines here with a, probably a marlin or a sailfish or a swordfish there. All right, so day five, bird and lung, uh, fish lungs, how are they different from mankind? So um, uh, this is a human lung here. And you could say that is an animal lung as well because animals that are created on day six have lungs much like humans. And it's called tidal breathing, like the motion of the tides. It comes in, goes out, comes in, goes out, comes in, goes out. And a bird, bird lungs are different. The bird lungs, like the motion of a racetrack, it moves around in a singular direction. It's called unidirectional or one way. All right, so birds breathe in, they, they make one move of their muscles, and then they breathe out, and the air goes out uh, a singular direction. It doesn't go both ways. Human lungs and bird lungs operate differently. Birds exchange air through rigid tubes. Air flows unidirectionally, one way, during both inspiration and expiration. Flight aids the unidirectional flow, creating aerodynamic valving forcing more air economically through the lungs, much like that of a jet engine. A jet engine takes in air from the front, 
and mixes it with fuel and comes out the other end as thrust. So birds are much like a jet engine in the way, particularly when they're flying. So you think about birds that fly for long, long periods of time. You see geese uh, right now that are moving. You see swans that are moving and they're going south. Everyone's flying south, Canadian geese flying south and so on. What do we know? We know that they fly for very long periods of time and they're able not to have their muscles tense up on them. What is happening? When they're flying, their mouths are open and high aerodynamic valving is forcing air through them like a jet engine. They actually are, are taking in more oxygen, and I describe all these things for you. So birds do not have human lungs. We breathe in, we breathe out. You can, and sometimes you can cut this off right here. Many times as people get older because they don't exercise, they don't, their lungs aren't operating correctly simply because they're not using them. They're not breathing air deeply enough into their lungs. Birds, when they're flying, the air is going all the way through their lungs because of aerodynamics. Fish have the very similar process that God made them in. Fish exchange oxygen by pulling water through their mouths and pumping it over their gills. The gills push the oxygen depleted water out through the gills on each side, right? Much like a jet aiding propulsion. Notice God's design. Swimming accelerates the process of air intake and successfully increases O2 absorption to match the increased demand from the working muscles of the fish. So when a fish is swimming, he's using up more energy. So he's burning fuel, but he also needs oxygen to burn that fuel. When he's swimming, he's forcing more air into his system to meet that demand automatically. The result is also a jet engine process in which swimming increases oxygen intake. Water goes in the mouth. You know, we look at fish, we know this stuff, but look how creatively God has made fish very similar to birds in design. Day five, uh, birds plant seeds, right? God created sea monsters, we know that. Now, in Genesis 7, there is a secret that I encoded some maybe 10, 12 years ago as I was looking at the Hebrew. I went into this verse and something didn't seem to be right about it. I know it was the Holy Spirit directing me there, so I didn't do it on my own. Also, of the birds of the sky by sevens, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of all the earth. That's what it says in my Bible, offspring. I went and looked up the word. The word is Zerah, right? There it is in the Hebrew. And Zera, right? So this is the primitive root, and this is the word that's being used. The primitive root, it means to sow figuratively, to disseminate, to plant, to fusify, right? In other words, to make fruit, right? It means, to, and this word means to seed, to fruit, to plant, to sowing time, posterity. In other words, to leave a posterity. When you leave a posterity, you leave something to your children and your grandchildren. The righteous man shall leave an inheritance to his children's children, Scripture says. So, Zerah is not offspring. Zerah means to plant or to leave a posterity by sowing. So, literally, seed, it means this word offspring means seed, not offspring, noting the Hebrew that I'm showing you here. Look at this, right? We have a bird with some sunflower seeds here, or some form of seed, probably sunflower. What happens when a bird eats seeds that are just a singular seed? They eat the inside of that seed out for the protein inside that seed. But what happens when they eat a seed and they consume a seed and they're getting protein from the outside of the seed? Let's look at that. All right, so here we see some berries, right? This bird is eating those berries. What happens to the seed because the, the bird is not is digesting the entire fruit. What happens when the bird digests that entire fruit? The seed comes out the other end and plants. Then God said, right? So we already know that uh, in the ASV, the Young's, the Darby, and other Bible interpretations to keep seed alive upon the face of the earth. Uh, in God's word, or in the NIV, to preserve animal life all over the earth after the flood, 
both are right. Birds plant seeds all over the earth with plants that all animals need to survive. Notice, floating masses and small emerging islands in the oceans are planted by birds discharging seeds, making life there possible just like day three. So birds have an important part in the ecosystem of the earth even this day by planting seeds all over the earth. You know, many people, uh, if you watch uh, nature programs, of course, I don't agree with the, the uh, you know, a good 50% of what their conclusions are, but they say, well, you know, floating debris you know, uh, that, uh, that from a storm is sent out to sea and it meets up and then the seeds that was in that floating debris causes the islands to grow. That's not true. Birds fly everywhere. Birds are more important in the planting of seeds than are the arbitrary, whimsical storm that might blow something out the sea. Birds are more reliable. Birds planting seeds like birds do on new islands today meant that Eden was not the only area of beauty and plant growth on Earth before the fall. So it wasn't just Eden that was doing well. Birds weren't put into an aviary and told to stay there and not leave the Garden of Eden. They flew all over the earth, and even though God had placed things there, they were also seeding the rest of the earth as well. And here we're reading from Job chapter 12. But now ask the beast and let them teach you. What are we learning? We're being taught. And the birds of the heavens, let them tell you. Or speak to the earth and let it teach you and let the fish of the sea declare to you. Right? Birds and fish are preaching to us right before our very eyes. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this or the hand of Yahweh has done this? And again, we see a migration there. And swarming. Similarities of birds and fish. Number one, the atmosphere has layers of air and where birds live, fish, the seas and oceans have layers of water, right? You know what the layers of water are. You'll, you can go down, you're going to not only have different uh, water pressure, but you're going to have a certain amount of sunlight or the absence of sunlight. The further down you go, you might be hitting uh, thermo uh, jets and thermo streams. Uh, under the water. Also, the further down you, that you go, you might be hitting different levels of plant growth. Still kind of close to the surface, but plant growth. What else are you going to have in the layers of the water? You're going to have different types of smaller fish that is schooling or swarming, uh, living at different layers until they feel that they need to come forward. Birds are controlled by day and night. Fish are controlled by day and night. So you can say birds are controlled by day and night. What, what is a, a type of bird that's awake at night? An owl. What's a type of bird that might be asleep at night? Well, just your common house wren and swallows and other things like that. All right, under fish, uh, a lot of fish on the reefs, they sleep at night. What doesn't sleep at night on the reefs? Sharks, right? Sharks then hunt on the reefs at night and they sleep many times, much of the time during the day, all right? Birds are streamlined for flight. Fish are streamlined for swimming. Uh, birds have lungs for flight. They actually take in more oxygen, as you just saw, and fish uh, gills for swimming. They take in more oxygen when they're moving. Right? Birds, there have been flying dragons on the land, and we have swimming dragons in scripture on the seas. And I'm going to give you some proofs. All right, birds, uh, flies in the layers of the air, Fish uh, swim in the layers of the sea. Uh, birds seem to fly effortlessly, and fish seem to swim effortlessly. All right, birds coded to watch solar and lunar cycles. This is why all certain types of uh, fish that are swarming will all they will all look for a lunar cycle or a solar cycle, and they will procreate on a specific night, one night out of the month. And they'll do it on one night only, and then if they missed an opportunity, then they can procreate 30 days later. All right? The fish and the birds do that. Uh, the birds, and I won't be talking about this today, but I have an entire study that I've done personally on how birds look at the sun, and they can tell where the sun is, and by looking at it, their brains are wired to know that they're supposed to fly south 
or fly north simply by looking at the angle of the sun. And science has proven that. Navigate by sun and moon, navigate by sun and moon. Uh, some bird species still remain undiscovered. We know that because we can go to the Amazon, we can go to different places around the globe and go, oh, we just discovered a brand new bird. Under fish, however, we know that many sea creatures still remain undiscovered. In fact, as I was studying uh, for this day, some of the older studies said that we have discovered most of the ocean, most of the ocean, that was like 20 years ago. Now, uh, science is, is coming out with a more humble statement and saying may, we may have discovered 15% of the animals in the ocean, 15%. With land, it's probably 85%. Uh, birds, number 12, birds have responded well to be fruitful and multiply. Fish have responded well to be fruitful and multiply. Now in the fossil record, we have uh, two different animals. These animals, here's pictures of what the uh, scientist and artist rendering from the fossil record looks like. Pleosaurs uh, were among the first fossil reptiles discovered. Beginning in the 19th century, scientists realized how distinctive their build was, and they were named a separate class in 1835. The pleosaur was first named in 1821. A hundred species have been discovered since then. A num the number of discoveries have increased, leading to an improved understanding of their anatomy, uh, uh, relationships, and way of life. The pleosaur family have a broad, flat body and a short tail with four long flippers and are powered by two strong muscles attached to two wide bony plates. The flippers make a flying movement through the waters. Pleosaurs breathe air and bore live young. They are believed to be warm-blooded. This is one is birthing right here and birthing here. Psalm 104, 25 and 26 says, there is in the sea great and broad in which are swarms without number, animals both great and small. There the ships move along, shipping lanes in other words, and Leviathan, which you have formed to sport in it. Ships move in the shipping lanes. Leviathan is not afraid of the ships and he sports in it. Leviathan then lived in the shipping lanes without fear. In the book of Job, God was describing real animals and serpents to Job who knew of these creatures. In other words, Job knew that these creatures existed. God's point was to humble Job in these descriptions. God did not invent a mythical creature that Job had never seen or known. All right, so what was the point of Job at the very end? The point of Job in chapter 38 uh, God is, well, chapter 36, 37, 38, God is beginning to wind down his, his conclusions to Job. Uh, you know, Job is going, why did you, have you treated me this way? Why have you abandoned me to the devil that go through all this? Even my friends hate me. And God says, Job, you do not understand the big picture. If you can understand the big picture, then I could explain it to you. But I can't explain it to you, so quit complaining. And it was, it's, even when I was doing this study this week, looking again at the book of Job, I was humbled again, realizing that my life is not my own. And much of our complaining is from us being limited in our understanding of what God is doing to us and through us. All right? On April 25th, 1977, the Japanese uh, trawler, Zuiu Maru, uh, fishing east of Christ Church in New Zealand, caught a 4,000 pound, 33 foot long creature in the trawl. The crew was convinced it was a yet uh, um, discovered fish, but despite its potential biological significance, they planned to dump it back into the ocean. First, some photos were taken, measurements and sketches were taken, nicknamed Nessie by the crew. They took samples of the skeleton, skin and fins for further analysis by experts in Japan. The discovery resulted in an immense a commotion and a pleosaur craze in Japan at that time. Now, modern scientists came out and say, well, they said that was a, uh, that was a type of large shark and it was just decomposing and that's what we're just looking at a decomposing large shark. And they were doing that to protect their own interest in saying that no mammal that has, you could say, antiquated 
description could be alive today. So many scientists say there are no dinosaurs alive today. But if you look at, look at anything in nature down, say, 3,000 feet or more, and they take the cameras down, you know, they don't take live people, but they take cameras down and fil film them, these are very frightening creatures that look they're like they're right out of the prehistoric age. So it's not to have a frightening creature swimming around or eventually die and float near the surface and be caught in a net. It's kind of interesting, right? So they threw it back. It's been debunked repeatedly by the, the, the science people. There's no one that's been able to say for a fact what it was. But it's interesting that my previous picture looks like this. That's 4,000 pounds of fish hanging right there. There's quite a few pictures taken of it. All right, Leviathan, the giant of the seas. Leviathan shows up six times in the Old Testament, twice in Job, Job 3 and Job 41, uh, in the Psalm uh, 74 and also Psalm 104, and Isaiah 27, Leviathan shows up twice. Many of your Bibles will retreat Leviathan as some other word that doesn't even sound like a living creature. Uh, so when you're reading uh, your Bibles and you come to these locations, make sure that the, uh, the translators of your particular interpretation uh, were translating correctly. Here's Leviathan in the Hebrew, right? It is uh, the Old Testament number, Strong's number 3867, a wreathed animal, i.e. a serpent, especially a crocodile, we're going to show that it was not a crocodile, or some other large sea monster, figuratively the constellation of the dragon in the sky. God describes 27 features of Leviathan in Job chapter 41. Here is a picture that was painted in 1120. It's at uh, Ghent University in Europe, and it's showing uh, the descriptions I've seen of this online, I believe, are wrong. I believe this is showing Christ right here. There's some, been some descriptions by people, I think, that don't know what they're talking about. And this is showing Leviathan. He's breathing fire. He has horns. He has kind of, uh, kind of a mane, right? A reef animal, like a lion mane. But it's different because he's a sea creature, and he has scales, and he has feet. And a strong, long tail. And here's Jesus Christ. I believe and presume that that's really what was intended through the picture, all right? Day five creation, Leviathan. Uh, here from Job 41, I'm just gonna read it. Can you draw Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many supplications to you? Or will he speak to you soft words? Will he make a covenant with you? In other words, a contract. Will you take him for a servant forever? In other words, will you turn him into a plow cow or something like that? Will you play with him as with a bird? Or will you bind him for your maidens? <laughs> will traders bargain over him? <laughs> will they divide him among the merchants? In other words, will they divide him like a tuna or a whale? Can you fill his skin with harpoons? In other words, you can't, right? And the harpoons don't work on him like they do whales. So this is not describing a whale. Or his head with fish spears. Lay your hand on him, remember the battle. You will not do it again. Behold, your expectation is false. Will you be laid low even at the sight of him? No one is so fierce that he dares to arouse him. Remember, this animal is living in the shipping lanes. So sailors are seeing this animal in the shipping lanes. He's describing this to Job. Job already is aware of the stories of this animal. Again, not a whale. All right? Uh, who has given to me that I should repay him? Whoever is under the whole heaven of mine, I will not keep silent concerning his limbs or his mighty strength or his orderly frame. Who can strip off his outer armor? Who can come within his double mail, right? So he has a double mail uh, breastplate. Who can open the doors of his face around his teeth? There is terror. I did the best I could trying to find pictures that I thought represented a Leviathan. I don't think any of them out there do it, and a lot of them are quite creepy. Um, 
Uh, because I, I think that there's a whole antichrist uh, phenomena out there just to draw creepy things out there and call it Leviathan. So don't believe everything you see on the internet. Let's keep reading. His strong scales are his pride, shut up as within a tight seal. Uh, one is so near to one another that no air can come between them. They are joined to one another, they clasp each other and cannot be separated. His sneezes flash forth light. Let's stop. There are bugs that uh, can emit light. We know we call them lightning bugs. But there are also bugs out there, land bugs right now that science say are living, that can actually sneeze or cough fire. And you can go online and you can see that. And it was said in scripture that we had land breathing dragons and ocean breathing dragons. Dragon just being another name for a great and ter terrible lizard. All right, so sneezing fire is not something that we should disbelieve. His eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth goes burning torches. Sparks of fire leap forth. Why would God say this if it wasn't true? Out of his nostrils, smoke goes forth as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His breath kindles coals and a flame goes forth from his mouth. So this whole thing, paragraph, is about him burning stuff. In his neck lodges strength and dismay leaps before him. The folds of his flesh are joined together, firm on him and immovable. His heart is as hard as a stone, even as hard as a lower millstone. So his heart is so tough and rugged. When he raises himself up, the mighty fear because of the crashing, they are bewildered. The sword that reaches him cannot avail, nor the spear, the dart, or the javelin. He regards iron as straw, bronze as rotted wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned into stubble for him. Clubs are regarded as stubble. He laughs at the rattling of the javelin. His other parts are like sharp potsherds, like he spreads out like a threshing sledge on the mire. He makes the depths boil like a pot. He makes the sea like a jar of ointment. Behind him, he makes a wake to shine. And by the way, the wake to shine, uh, when ships go through the oceans at night, they churn up the algae and, the, and, the, and the, all the different sea creatures, and they actually begin to glow. If, you, if a plane turns off its lights at night, and they can follow a ship because a ship will leave a wake that is actually glowing. All right, he makes a wake to shine, so he does it like a ship. That's how big he is. One would think the deep to be gray-haired. Nothing on earth is like him, one made without fear. He looks on everything that is high. He is king over all the sons of pride. Absolutely. So this enormous description is being given to Job to tell Job, quit complaining. I have a plan. You know what the plan was? To give us the book of Job so that we would quit complaining. Because Job is about people turning on others because when bad things happen to them, number one and number two, people wondering why they're going through what they're going through. All right. So I got this. This is a sign, part of a sign. I did a close-up and cropped it. This is a sign at the monastery at the Lindis Farm. It's an island off of northeast England. All right, the picture reads, dragons attacked and fiery dragons were seen flying in the air. Vikings attacked and fiery dragons were seen flying in the air. What does that sound like? Sounds like a flying dinosaur, doesn't it? But it's fiery dragons. In AD 793, the Vikings raided the island and looted the monastery. Continuing raids forced the monks to abandon uh, Linda's frame in 876, right? They actually rehabited it later on, and now it's a tourist attraction. Given that the description of Leviathan and breathing fire does not describe a known creature today, neither a whale or a crocodile, and may be an, an extinct creature, it was a sea serpent or dragon that had breathed fire, or a flying creature or a creature that leapt out of the air, much like we know uh, many creatures to leap out of the ocean into the air today. Leviathan was certainly known then and alive in 793 AD. 
if that was a Leviathan. Okay. Vikings raided the island, looted the monastery, continuing raids forced monks to abandon. A century later, they were moved to her final resting place. The oceans are rich with life. Here's another swarm. Scientists now believe that they have greatly underestimated the quantity of fish in the sea. So if you go online, the AI-generated answer on Google will say that uh, land has 85% of all the animals on planet Earth, and the oceans have only 15%. You know, that's not true. Think about it. How many layers are in the sea? Layer after layer after layer has habitable living conditions for creatures that live under the water, habitable. Land animals, including birds, have to land somewhere at night. Fish in the ocean don't. Fish in the ocean can just park themselves at a layer that they're familiar with, at a temperature that they're familiar with, and they can sleep in that layer without having to lay on anything or nest in anything. Think of all the layers in the ocean. We don't have the same layers above the land in the air. We have, don't have that many layers. Birds have to land somewhere. Everything has to land, not in the ocean. I believe that the oceans are so undiscovered now. And again, I love watching nature programming, so I have a lot of evidence to give, right? God blessed them, saying, be fruitful, multiply, fill the waters of the sea, and let the birds multiply on the earth. There was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. God said, see, I have given you plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the land and every tree with which seed is in fruit and you shall have them for food. That's in Genesis. All right, day five, uh, creation conclusions. All this perfection did not just happen. Spontaneous living has never been observed in nature or in the laboratory. Evolutionists keep moving the evolutionary timetable back further and further, yet it still does not tell us how did it happen 500 million years ago. So if you say, well, it happened 500 million years ago, how did it happen? Don't move it back another million years or trillion years and then say you just solved the problem. You didn't solve the problem. How did it happen? Science cannot explain it without the Bible. No one has witnessed the origin of life. No one has witnessed life from non-life or spontaneous Evolution is a speculation of purported unobservable events. Evolutionists will still claim that their proofs are missing links yet to be discovered. Missing links are, well, still missing. We do not have any feathered dinosaurs, even though they keep coming up. Well, we have a feathered dinosaur, and then other scientists come out and go, no, it's not. So even within the scientific community, science keeps unraveling the science, but you don't see when it comes unraveled that it gets on the front page, right? There are no feathered dinosaurs, period, or birds evolving into dinosaurs. The Bible is still our best dating system for creation and time. Amen. Genesis is our birth certificate showing when and where we came from. God has given us his perfect eyewitness account and he's done it simply. He's not made it confusing. It takes a theologian to confuse us on that. Theologians and preachers have added millions of years to the creation account in the Bible and now cannot make the rest of the Bible believable at all. Once you destroy Genesis 1 and 2, the rest of the Bible is completely unbelievable. And it's a sequence of events that happen rapidly, which is why many people do not believe in a worldwide flood any longer. All fossils can be attributed to Noah's flood. Order never proceeds out of disorder unless a higher power affects it. All right? What happens to your computer? It gets a virus. What do you do? You take it in. You run your virus program. And so what do you have happening? The virus program built by a greater entity now is cleaning up your computer and bringing it back into order. Most professing creationist preachers are really evolutionists believing in an old earth and a pre-Adamite fall and the destruction of the earth prior to Adam and Eve being formed on the earth. Most of my friends that are in ministry say that they're creationists, and yet they believe in a pre-Adamite fall. They believe in a pre-Adamite flood. They believe that billions of dead things, that God built Eden over billions and billions of dead things that were rotting underneath the Garden of Eden. And yet God said it was good. 
And when you add billions of years to the biblical account, that's the only thing that's left for you to do, is now to re reword and confuse those that are listening to your teaching. Here we have all these birds and fish under the sea. One of the things I believe, and I used to believe that God, because, you know, uh, we have in science, we have a thing called fish, and then we have a thing called mammals, right? We have air-breathing mammals, air, you know, so whales are air-breathing mammals. When we classify everything like that, then we want to classify whales as mammals being made on day six. But God does not make anything in the oceans on day six. He's making land animals on day six. So I believe that whales were made on day five because he said all sea creatures, great and small. For the wrath of God, Romans chapter one, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. In other words, at the white throne judgment, he's going to go, you saw nature, didn't you? For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give him thanks. But they came futile in their speculations, right? Evolution is speculation. And their foolish heart was darkened. You cannot be influenced by ideas out of Scripture to reform Scripture, right? 500 years ago, most people thought the world was flat. But Isaiah said, who sits on the circle of the earth? Many preachers that believe in an old earth are now saying that homosexuality is okay, that the devil is a figment of our imagination, and that Jesus really didn't die on the cross for our sins. Science has accepted distortion of truth, not reality of truth. The reason that many preachers today do not agree with the literal six 24-hour solar days is because of the opinions of men. They were not there. No one was there. And just because you give someone a sheepskin and says, well, you're a scientist or you're a, uh, you know, you're a geologist, does not make you right in your claims. We'll be looking at Nebraska man next. Let's all stand. And Kathy, would you like to join me up here? Whether you're a creationist or an evolutionist, doesn't matter. What God cares mostly is that he has your heart and that you've received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And if you'd like to do that right now, uh, just bow your head uh, with me and my wife and others here in our congregation and receive Jesus right now. Amen. Say, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, come into my heart right now, into my heart right now. and make me, a new person, make me a new person, a new creation. A new creation. I don't want to be that old person anymore. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me so that I don't have to die for all the things that I've done wrong. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Now, if you just gave your heart to Jesus Christ, we want to hear from you. Write us at David Gonzalez Ministries, P.O. Box 847, Lake Delton, Wisconsin, 52940. We'd love to hear from you, and I want to send out this free little booklet to you, Is the Bible for Real? For all of those that are watching, I'd love to put that little booklet into your hand and my first edition of 30 Days of Praying the Our Father. Get your life right with God and get praying daily on a regular basis and get into the habit of doing it by getting that book free of charge for me. No gimmicks. Also, I just talked for about an hour. If you're watching us on television, uh, you need to go to our website, mountainfaith.org, and on our homepage in the center are quick links that will take you to this teaching in its entirety for free. You can watch it for free. You don't have to pay us for it. You can watch it in your classrooms. You can share it with your church or your Bible study or just watch it at home. Well, this is Pastor Dave and Kathy Gonzalez saying, Press into God. And he'll press into you. And we'll see you again here next Sunday at the mountain. Amen. Click subscribe. Click the thumbs up on our messages. Click the little bell. Get your friends saved. Get your family saved.